morning, everybody. So glad you're here this morning. Let's all stand together. We're going to give God some praise this morning. We just invite you to lift your hands, lift your hearts, and just sing your praises out to Him. If He's been good to you today. of your grace, your grace that knows no end. Father, we just worship you this morning. We 
give you praise and honor. We love you, Jesus. One more time, church, can you clap your hands and give him a shout of praise?
don't you give your voice a shout of praise in this house today? Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus. I magnify you, Jesus. Man, if we could sing that chorus one more time, but before we do, could you just imagine that Pastor Jesus Christ is standing right outside that door, and he's getting ready to walk down these aisles and come to the front. And his ministry of compassion and mercy is getting ready to be spilled out all over this place. And we, we are getting ready to sing to him. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing better than you. There is nothing more satisfying in you. There is nothing that can fill me. There is nothing that can heal me. There is nothing that can complete me. So as we sing this chorus one more time, Jesus Christ, amen. Better than you, there's nothing. Better than you, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I worship you, Jesus. Yeah, there is nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Just one more time. Oh, yeah. There's nothing. There is nothing better than you. Nothing is better. Yes. Hallelujah. Reach out and touch the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One more time, why don't you just give up some worship for Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the Alpha, Omega, first and last, beginning, the ending. Amen. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. He is here today. Amen. In Jesus' name, you may be seated this morning. Feel the power of the presence of God in this place this morning. Anybody feel that? Amen. It's real. It's for us. It's for right now. You can have it. It's for your kids too. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As you came in today to the Life Church, I hope you grabbed a worship guide. If you didn't, grab one on the way out. But I'm just going to go over real quick with you a few announcements. Uh, tonight at, hold on, get it right, 5.30. Someone say 5.30. We're having a youth meeting for the uh, student age youth group. Make sure you're here. Bring a friend. Have a good time tonight. Very important, next Sunday we're having the baby dedication. So if you have a baby, we'd love to dedicate that baby to the Lord. And, and that'd be an honor. Uh, but make sure you fill out this little card in the worship guide. And on here, there's not a spot for size, but it's important that you put the size on there so the church can get a little gift for your baby. Amen. Jesus loved kids. Life Church loved kids. Amen. 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 Next, you'll see in that uh, package is a giving envelope. We appreciate the giving that comes forward in this church. Allow all these ministries to go forth. And uh, you can give either in the giving boxes on your way out or online. I believe it's lifechurchcarlisle.com. I hope I got that right. Otherwise, I just sent you to a different website. And, and I, I can't, I'm not responsible for what happens next. Amen. Last but not least, the Next Steps uh, program. This church has guided this Next Steps program. And, and honestly, I came, started coming to this church last year, about September or so, and I'm a part of this program We'd love to get to know you as a family, as a church family. If you if you need prayer after church, just come back. Someone will be back at that table waiting to pray with you. If you'd like to walk into salvation, we'd love to be a part of that. If you're looking to be baptized, that's a wonderful experience. If you're looking to explore a ministry in your life or be on a team at this church, this church is waiting and ready for you to be a part of it. It's a great church to go to. Amen. Amen. I just feel the presence of the power of God. We're getting ready to hear the word, but before we do, we're going to dismiss all the kids, all the kids, fifth grade and under, go out that back door, and there'll be staff out there waiting to take you to class. Amen. One more time, why don't you give it up for Jesus Christ as Pastor Jason comes this morning.
this. There's a lot to mourn about, but the Bible told us that God would turn mourning into dancing. Oh, man. I, I'm not much of a dancer, but I like doing it. You know that old saying, dance like nobody's watching? You know, that's what you got to do sometimes, you know. And I, I, the idea that he turns seas into highways. Well, that goes back to Moses and the Red Sea. And listen, you're facing a situation in your life where there's an uh, obstacle in front of you and an army behind you and obstacles on both sides of you and there's no way out. God's just going to part a seat. God's just like, we're going to get you out of here in a way that you'd never imagine. That is the God we serve. Somebody say amen. Well, listen, guys, I want to say one more time, welcome to Life Church today. Good to see everybody. Thank you for being here. And I also want to say all my people online, I'm, I'm keeping up with you here. Um, I'm looking at you. I see you all on there. Janet, I see Aunt Janet on there. I love you guys. I'm glad that you're watching. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to the day when you feel safe enough to come in. Um, and we're just continuing to pray uh, that God would, you know what, I, I'm not talking about like, how am I going to say this? I don't even want... I want an eradication to COVID. I want it gone from the earth. I don't want it coming back next year and dealing with it next month. Can I get an amen? We want this gone. I'm praying that God would do that. And we pray for everybody who has been infected by this virus, affected by this virus, that you would be blessed, healed, and brought back to not new normal. We want normal. Everybody say normal. All right. Um, listen, we're in week three, week three of the series. And the series is called, I Believe in God, But... I believe in God, but um, week one, we, we talked about how I believe in God, but I don't know him. I don't know him. And we talked about getting to know God. How many of y'all want to know God? All right. Um, that was like halfway Southern. How many of y'all want to know God? What am, I talking, what am I saying here? Week two, last week, a little tougher. I believe in God, but I don't fear him. And we talked about coming under the fear of the Lord, how we're not supposed to be afraid of God, but that the fear of the Lord comes in and it doesn't make us afraid of him, but makes us love him even more when we understand the father in our life. Remember, I told my kids, I'm gonna, we gave our kids an Xbox for Christmas last year and they were the happiest kids ever. And then a couple months later, they got the Xbox taken away for a bad attitude. And they had, that, that wasn't happy. They were not, they were very disappointed. But the proper relationship between father and son, there is joy and there is disappointment. And the same thing happens in God when he has to come and say, all right, guys, got to take the Xbox away. Yeah. All right. And we don't like that. It got quiet last week. Well, who wants to hear that kind of stuff? But it's true. All right. Somebody afterwards, after church, Kyle's like, must have been hitting some hearts because it was quiet in here today. I was like, well, the old preacher said it's tight, but it's right. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right, yeah. Next Sunday, guys, is a baby dedication. Very important Sunday. So um, I want to reiterate uh, Pastor Dave's words. If you have a baby uh, child who wants to be dedicated, you'd like that baby or child to be dedicated to the Lord, they never have, uh, please feel free to bring your baby. We'd love to dedicate them to the Lord uh, next week. And then after that, we're going to be wrapping this series up. And the final message in this series is called, I Believe in God, But I Don't Trust Him Completely. That's coming. We're going to get into trust, right? Our trust issues with our trust issues with people affect our trust with God, okay? So today might be the hardest one. Y'all here for me? You're, you're going to back me up a little bit? Today's message is I believe in God, but I don't, I don't go overboard, all right? I believe in God, but I don't go overboard. I'm not one of those wacky Jesus freaks, okay? And so I, this is taken from a book I told you called The Christian Atheist. Very good book. Get a hold of that on Amazon if you want to. Pastor Craig Rochelle, Christian Atheist. And he uh, defined, it's weird, isn't it? Christian Atheist. It's an oxymoron. What does that mean? We all know that atheists are people who do not believe in God. Not talking bad about anybody. I know some good people that are atheists. It's fine. Um, but what does it mean to be Christian Atheist? And he defines it as someone who believes in God but lives as if he doesn't exist. Well, that's tough, all right? So we're talking about today, we're talking about believing in God, but not going overboard. It's like, I believe in God, but I'm not one of those fanatic types, you know? I'm not going to get too carried away. Like, I believe in God, but in that Sunday morning experience, that's real cool. I like to feel God, and that's all great. But, you know, outside of there, man, I mean, I, 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 I'm kind of chill, okay? So I'm going to take a scripture reference today from the book of Revelation. We go all the way back to the end of the Bible. book of Revelation was written by John the Revelator. Imagine that. I think he got that name after he wrote it, right? So John the Revelator, he also wrote three epistles in the New Testament, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. He also wrote the Gospel of John. 
Okay, so this was a prolific writer in your New Testament. Uh, he was a disciple of Jesus. He was called by his followers, or by his friends, rather, John the Beloved, the only disciple who was at the foot of the cross while Jesus was crucified. Remember, Peter, Judas killed himself. Peter denied him. Everybody scattered. John at the foot of the cross. It was John who Jesus spoke to from the cross and said, this is my mother, take care of her. He gave charge to his mother, charge to John, sorry, to care for his mother. Uh, so during and after the book of Acts, when you get into J Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the, uh, these are the gospels. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels, and then they have a lot of similar content. John is set apart. Uh, there are no parables in the book of John. The first three books of the New Testament have the parables of Jesus. You will not read about parables in the book of John. And some say, well, people say because John knew him so well, it is is just a storybook of the life of Jesus from John's perspective. Okay, during the book of Acts comes after the epistle, I'm sorry, the gospels, and the book of Acts records the acts of the apostles. Now, during and after the book of Acts, the disciples changed the world by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was said of them that they were those who turned their world upside down. Man, when they preached, powerful things happened. They saw healing. The dead were raised. Many people were baptized by the thousands. There was conversions everywhere, all throughout Jerusalem, throughout Judea, throughout Asia, all the way into Greece. The Roman Empire was being turned upside down by Christianity. And so what happened was, one by one, the disciples were rounded up by authorities. They were imprisoned, and many of them, in fact, eventually all of them, except for John, were killed for their faith. Peter was crucified upside down because they were going to crucify him and said, he said, yeah, well, I'm not worthy to be killed the way Jesus was killed. So they said, fine, they turned him upside down and crucified him. The apostle Paul, who wrote so many books of the Bible and preached magnificent messages and led revivals, he was beheaded in Rome for his beliefs. And we come to John, and John was the hardest one of them to kill. Uh, tradition has John dying of an old, as an old man peacefully, okay? But we know that uh, he was arrested in Ephesus, and he was thrown into a pit or a pot, rather, of boiling oil. The disciple, the apostle, John the beloved, John the revelator, he was uh, captured for preaching the name of Jesus somewhere in Ephesus, and he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil, but he came out completely unharmed. Kind of like a fiery furnace or Daniel in the lion's den type thing happened to John. They couldn't kill John, so they enslaved him and they banished him to the island of Patmos to work in the mines for the Roman Empire. It was there, forced into slavery on that island, that John received the revelation. Okay? Now, in the early chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus appears to John and tells him to write letters to the seven churches of Asia. There are seven churches in Asia at this point. They're, they're powerful, magnificent churches are doing great things. And he says, you know, and there's, you'll read that, you'll write into the church of uh, this church and that church. I, I, uh, this is good, but this isn't good. But when he gets to the church of Laodicea, which we're going to read about, he has nothing good to say about this particular church. And I would argue that that might be a church that believed in God, but didn't go overboard. Okay. And so Laodicea is a, an ancient Greek city, okay? It was later grafted into the Roman Empire. The ruins of Laodicea exist today, and they're located in the country of Turkey. Laodicea was a very wealthy city, and it was a sprawling metropolis throughout the Asia Minor world of the ancient days. Um, it was later destroyed by earthquakes, but after archaeologists located its, it, uh, found its location, some over my words today, my goodness, uh, archaeologists located where the old city was. They began to uh, excavate. And when they got in, they found amazing ruins. And you could go there today. I don't know if you want to travel to Turkey. That's up to you, but hey. Archaeologists uncovered ruins in large theaters everywhere around Laodicea. Lavish public baths, wide promenades, fabulous shopping centers, uh, there's a huge stadium. doesn't rival the Colosseum, but it's very close to the Colosseum of Rome. There were temples. There was artwork, Roman mosaics throughout the, the floors of all the buildings they were uncovering. And guess what else they found? Well, they found big homes, and they found all these places. They also found the church of Laodicea. 
with all of the Christian inscriptions still in the marble, they actually found the church of Laodicea. It'd be, it'd be amazing to go see that, wouldn't it? So what happened is toward the end of the first century AD, the Spirit of God speaks to the seven churches. And in Revelation chapter 3, we find a scathing review of the church of Laodicea. And I'm going to read that to you. In Revelation chapter 3, we'll look at verses 14 through 17, and then we're going to look at verse 20. Okay? So Jesus talks to John the Revelator, and he says, write this letter to an angel, to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. And Jesus says, I know all the things you do. That's a scary thought. All of them? That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Okay? You say, talking to that church in Laodicea, you say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Talking about a God who can see through the trappings of the world. Okay? Okay? That's, that's pretty harsh, right? You say, I'm rich. I got everything I want. I don't need anything. And the, and the Lord's like, no, no, no. You think that because you have worldly goods. You got it made. However, I'm looking at your soul and you don't realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay? Now, we'll skip down. There's good news in that scripture. In verse 20, he ends the church of Laodicea by saying, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door... I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. That's good. That's good. Man, he said, I know everything you do. I know all the things you're doing. I know it all. I see it all. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but you're not. You're lukewarm. Um, any, any coffee drinkers in the house today? Anybody get a nice hot cup of coffee out in the cafe? Am I? Do we have any iced coffee drinkers? I like it too, man. Now, isn't it interesting about coffee? Coffee's good hot and coffee's good cold. Nothing better than a lukewarm cup of coffee though, right? I didn't think so. I, in fact, hang on just a second. Let me see. Here we go. Here we go. I got a cup of, I got a cup of Casey's coffee that's been sitting here since 6.30 this morning. It's about halfway full. I didn't finish it all. Would anybody like a sip of my you know what I did today? I went half and half on French vanilla cappuccino. I was just in a, I was in a, I was in a mood today. Man, I guarantee you what, if I were to pick this up not knowing, and I was outside on the job site, I used to, I worked construction for many years, and I, it's happened to me before, I, oh, I forgot my coffee. That's disgusting. But you know what? I, it's funny because I, like I like iced coffee. I'll go to McDonald's and get like the, the iced coffee. I think it's really good. It's weird. And it's good really hot, but halfway between, uh, no way. No. You know, and I'll be sitting, I get caught up talking at the old 50 cafe sometimes. And I, I'm like uh, talking away and, and depends on who the waitress is. They haven't filled my coffee up. Not that they're watching, but if you are. <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh, I need a warm up, right? You, you ever, right, Aunt Marilyn, you, you serve a lot of coffee. You got to go around doing warm-ups, don't you? You got to warm that stuff up. <laughs> I'm not going to give you that. I'm not going to give you that. I'm... It's interesting. It's interesting. When it's lukewarm, you, you spit that out. That's not good. Now, guys, listen. Jesus speaks to the church in Laodicea. And he says, since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, this is the New Living Translation I read to you, and it's being really nice. And I'll tell you why. The Old English Translation, specifically the King James, you know what the King James says? I will spew. You all know what spew means, don't you? In fact, the New King James goes a step further, and it actually uses the word vomit. Well, let's just hear me here, okay? We're talking about spitting spewing and vomiting, and that's some stuff we don't want to talk about. But uh, that word, the word that all those words come from is Greek. 
There's a Greek word that translates there. It's the only time that word appears in the entire Bible. And that word is Greek. It's emeo, emeo. It means to spew, to spit, or vomit. So all three of them got it right. But this understanding can go quickly from spitting out some cold coffee to something that really makes you sick. We're, we're talking less about room temperature coffee and more about like hot mayonnaise. I am, oh. Hey, listen, I hate throwing up, guys. Anybody? Oh, I, I do not like throwing up. Like, I will wait as long as possible. I know I have to, and I know I will feel better afterwards, but I don't want to. Oh, gosh, I hate throwing up. There's something about, and can I just get raw for a second? Why do we throw up in toilets when you do other things in there? It's just disgusting. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm, I'm sorry, but, oh. Oh. Like, throwing up is the worst and I'll be honest with you, since recovering from COVID-19, I, I, my, my residual effects, I just, I have nauseated feelings like all, like randomly throughout the day, just like I'm feeling fine. And then like, woof, like if I wanted to, I could just spew right now, right? <laughs> like there's this one little thing going on. I got fatigue. I get home at like 6.30. I'm like on the couch. I'm like, I'm ready to go to bed. Now, maybe that's old age. I don't know. But whatever, whatever. I just don't. But I get this nauseated feeling. And I'll be honest with you. I'm just going to be honest with you. Last Thursday night, we were here for music rehearsal. I was on the drums. I reached over to get my phone and I threw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> and I set up I'm like, oh God, that is just, I mean, whoa, that is the worst thing. I know, I know I'm talking about disgusting things. Forgive me. But I've got to get the point across what that scripture means. Because we glance over that, oh, that's nice. God will spit us out of his mouth. No. You've you got to understand, right? Okay. We're looking at a scripture where God is telling the church that their actions and lifestyles make him want to throw up. I told you it's going to be a hard one today. You see, it's when we believe in God, but we just want to, we don't go overboard with it. Because we're not hot or cold. We're lukewarm. And we make God sick. Okay. Now, we're blessed in this country with a lot of things, guys. And is it possible that our comfortable worship routines and our freedoms have made us lukewarm Christians? Is it possible? So we're going to go look at a handful of characteristics of what it means to be a lukewarm Christian. Now, here, <clears throat> lukewarm Christian. Now, here's the deal. If I preach an okay today, you may think about a few people. Uh, you, you may see these qualities in other people if I'm preaching okay. And if I'm preaching good today... You may see them in yourself. So I pray that I preach good today. All right? Let's look at some characteristics. I got seven of them. <clears throat> characteristics of a lukewarm Christian. Turn around to your neighbor and say amen. I know. You know that was just so I can get a drink of water. I know. <clears throat> characteristics of lukewarm Christians. Number one. You ready? Number one. Lukewarm Christians crave acceptance from people more than acceptance from God. Let that sink in. Lukewarm Christians crave acceptance from people more than acceptance from God. I remember a scripture in the Bible where Jesus said, don't fear man who can destroy your body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul. But we live in a selfie society, right? We're focused on how many likes we can get. We're focused on our selfies, and maybe this angle is better. Oh, I didn't get any likes. Maybe I'll turn to this way. Oh, that was terrible. Maybe I'll put a duck face. And you're just trying to get likes. You're, you're selfie-centered. <clears throat> and, and here's what happens. We post our highlight reels so people can see the best of us. And then when things go wrong, we like to post that too so they know how bad we've got it. And the Bible said this, when we're getting, every, we want everybody to like us, but Jesus said, woe to you if all men like you. Because if everybody likes you, something's probably not right there. You just, you can please what most of the people some of the time or whatever. You can't please them all, guys. But it's just, we're worried to death about what people think. We're just worried to death. And, it's, and here's the deal. It's reflected in everything we do from the way we dress to our social media posts. And our culture is so image conscious. And, and, and my worry, is, I look and you know what I'm about to say. You understand this. Children are becoming more aware of their image at a, at a younger age than ever before. Yeah. Worried to death about their image, right? And so here's my question, guys. Are we training ourselves... 
and our children to crave acceptance from people more than acceptance from God. I hope I can understand and teach my kids, some people aren't going to like you and it doesn't matter. You got to live peaceably and love and be nice, but hey, shake the dust off your feet. Let's go find somebody who does like us because you're better than that. I'm not going to sit here worrying, right? <clears throat> So if you're craving acceptance from people more than acceptance from God, I'm just going to quote Kenny Loggins and say it's the highway to the danger zone, (laughs) right? Number two, lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith in Christ. And there's a lot of reasons for this. You know, you don't want to be that weirdo. Uh, You don't want to get rejected. You know, you're you're a little bit embarrassed. You got a little fear. I don't know. But I got to ask you guys, do you really believe today that the gospel has the power to transform lives? Do you really believe this is the answer for the world that we're living in? I do. I believe. That's why I'm up here Sunday after. I believe it's the answer. There's a dark world out there where people are hurting and they're suffering and they're afraid. And we need God in our lives and they need God in their lives. But when we, the Bible says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And I I believe in this culture right now today, we need to get over our fears and share the gospel of Jesus. Little song we used to sing, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. He's the way, the truth, he's the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. And now the answer that we're looking for is in Jesus. Every answer, it's not always in this church, but it's in Jesus. It's not always in this preacher, but it's in Jesus. It's not always in what I got going. It's in Jesus. And I can tell you, whatever you need is in Jesus. And let me give you one more scripture. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you don't confess me. See, sometimes we got to get into the hard stuff, guys. If you don't confess me, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those are lovely scriptures, but there's also some content in there that we need to hear today. If we don't confess him, he won't confess us. I got a tough one. You all ready for some tough stuff? Number three, lukewarm Christians rationalize their sin. What does that mean? Well, modern culture has rebranded what previous culture considered sin. And and sometimes it's not sin, but it's weight. I've talked to you about the difference between a weight and a sin. You you can't go to heaven with sin in your heart. You can go to heaven with weight, but it's it's a tough journey, man, when you're pulling a, you know. So we don't have sin in our culture now. I'm not talking about the church. The world, they rebrand. We don't have sin anymore. We don't have weight anymore. We don't, we have adult content. What's adult content, right? Profanity is no longer profanity. It's adult language. Oh, I got quiet on that. Think about it. There's just some things that are profane. There's just some vulgar things. Now, you're not going to offend me because I worked construction for 22 years. I've been there and done that. I heard it. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be like Mr. Goody Two Shoes. It's not like that. It's just that uh, there's even job talk. Sometimes it gets, okay. And I'll be like, all right, guys, that's just like, yeah. You just got disgusting at that point, And that's not really what I want to feed into my mind, you know. And so when I'm looking at my kids, like if I heard my kids say a few things, I'd be like, you know what? That's adult language. What is that teaching them? Well, you can't say that until you're adult. When I'd rather you never say that in your life. Okay. What about pornography? It's not pornography. It's adult entertainment. You all hear what I'm saying? So we we rebrand things and then we rationalize sin. You all hear me today. We rationalize sin with terms like, well, that's my body, my choice. Well, I can do what I want. Well, everybody else is doing it. Well, I'm not hurting anybody. And we rationalize our lifestyle when we're lukewarm Christians. And can I tell you one more thing? We rationalize our sinful lifestyle based on cultural norms rather than God's word. What if we as a church, as a body of Christ, went back to the word of God and said, Lord, let my life be a light shining to this dark world. Let me fall under. Listen, we're all not going to get it right, and I'm not saying... 
I'm not even acting like when you get cut off at the four-way, something might not fly out the mouth. Okay, I'm not acting like we're all perfect. I'm saying don't let culture dictate to you how to rationalize a sinful lifestyle. And I'm not talking about... I'm not, I'm not acting like sin was because you let something slip at the. There, I'm talking about deeper stuff, and I'm making light of it with a word or two. Okay, I'm talking about the deep stuff. Remember what the scripture said? If I'm not mistaken, Jesus told the church in Laodicea, "I see everything you do." Stuff that we don't want to get into in a situation like this. We don't want to talk about in front of other people. Jesus sees it, and we rationalize it. Can I tell you? Let your life. Line up to God's word, not to culture. Okay? Okay? Um, let me see here. Number four, we're, we're going to get through this. <clears throat> this is the big one. Because lukewarm Christians think more about their life on earth than their life in heaven. Lukewarm Christians are more focused here then they are focused there. And I hear the word of God telling me not to lay up treasures on earth where moths and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven where neither moths nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if you're laying up treasures here, your heart is here. We're not looking for that city. The Bible said of Abraham, he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was walking around looking for something different than what this world has to offer. We are so consumed with life on earth that we put heaven in the back seat. The apostle Paul said to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Meaning if I'm alive, I'm alive in Christ. But if I die, I'm going to heaven and I'm getting there before everybody else is. Right? We cling to life with every last breath in our body. I got to be completely honest with you. My grandmother died when she was 84 years old, 84 good years. She was blessed, and I'd be blessed to live that long. But I wept like a baby for days, if not weeks. I think it was about a year after my grandmother died, I woke up with a pain in my stomach. I'm in, you know, two hours later, I'm getting my appendix taken out. Simple procedure, but what happened that day, it'd been a year since my grandmother, or about a year since my grandmother passing, I went to the emergency room and they brought a gown. And it was the same ground my grandmother was in the day she died. And I fell apart. And I couldn't stop weeping. You're like, isn't that weird? I'm like, it just hit me so hard. When I saw, anyway, we cling, cling, cling. Now, there was a part of me that realized my grandmother served the Lord since she was a child. She got baptized in the Cascade River when she was like six years old to fill the Holy Spirit. You know, right down the road down here. You know, and, and you know what happened when my grandmother gave up her last breath on this earth? She went into a heavenly realm. She sat at the feet of Jesus. She met people from her past. And she, my goodness, I still believe in heaven. I still believe it's a place where there's no tears and no sorrow and no pain. And I still believe that when I die, I'm going to see Jesus. My goodness, I still believe that the earth is temporary and heaven's eternal. My Lord, I believe in that. Life is a vapor. I'm clinging on to it with everything. And listen, guys, I, want, I got little kids. I want to raise my kids. I, I want to see them grow up. I want to see some grandkids. But Lord, have mercy. Paul got done talking about the earth. And he said, but even so, come Lord Jesus. Come on back and get us and let's get out of here. Can I, can I read you a couple of scriptures about heaven real quick? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 55. The apostle Paul said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye and the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and when this mortal shall have put on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? And I got one more in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul wrote this too. He said, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died, 
that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which sleep. Now hear me, guys. For the Lord, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I didn't give you this scripture, Noah. I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. My goodness. And then verse 18 says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What does that mean? You having a hard time? Let me tell you a story. One of these days, he's coming back for us. Well, everything, you're, you're dooming, you're glooming, you, you, you lost everything, you lost it all, it's all gone. Let me tell you something. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. The old hymnal said, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Well, that's the kind of songs we sang when I was a kid. You know why? Because those songs were birthed out of the Great Depression. They were birthed out of the Civil War. They were birthed out of struggle. And everybody was like, I hate this life. This is terrible. You know, back in the day, you'd have five, six kids, and three of them would die before they hit adulthood. Infant mortality rates were crazy high. There was typhus, and there was tuberculosis, and there was measles, and there was polio. And we got all these vaccines now. We're all living. We're healthy, man. Look at us. Not just healthy, we're fat. We got all kind of food. Look at, I mean, I got, I'm, I'm carrying around a spare tire because I'm living good, y'all. Those songs about heaven were birthed out of struggle when the earth wasn't worth living in. All right, lukewarm Christians think more about life on earth than life in heaven. I got I to gotta get going. Number five, lukewarm Christians only turn to God when they need something. Everything's good. Don't need God. Everything falls apart. We need God. This, not this church. I would never, this would never happen in this church. But in my father-in-law's church. It would never happen here. But in my father-in-law's church, there was a handful of people. You only saw them on Sunday when something was going wrong. And they come in the door. Whoop, what's happening now? Need some God. Well, hit the altar, need some God, all right? Never happened here, no way. But I think about how we, we don't need God when everything's going good, but when everything falls apart. You know what, what makes me think of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse? Come inside, it's fun inside. Because in each episode of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, I watched a lot of them, guys, trust me. <clears throat> you had the mousecatool, mousecadoodle or whatever. And in the mousecatool thing, you had four tools. And Mickey's like, we got a hammer and we got a bucket and we got a... A blowtorch. <laughs> and the mystery mouse couture. Think about it. And, and Mickey's like, that's the mystery mouse couture. That's a surprise tool that can help us later. <laughs> and I would say that lukewarm Christians treat God like the mystery mouse couture. Yeah. Something's going wrong. <clears throat> well, grab the wrench. We can do this. I'll grab the bucket. Somebody grab the blowtorch. Right? Now, my goodness, and we, we will do everything we can to take care of it on our own until all of a sudden, you know what? Oh, toodles. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's a, it's a, it's a hoot, guys. I'm, I'm just joking. But it's like, we need the mystery mouse tool. We need God. Show up and save us. Something goes wrong and we're grabbing because lukewarm Christians only turn to God when they need something. It's all good and we can figure, figure out on our own. We just leave God up on the shelf. We leave God in the toolbox. Well, we'll grab him when we need him. You all with me? Number six, <clears throat> lukewarm Christians will only, I'm sorry, <clears throat> lukewarm Christians only give when it's convenient. Or lukewarm Christians only give when it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. Bible said God loves a cheerful giver, right? 
I, I know, listen, hey, I understand because like if you're, if you're a lady and you're driving down the road and you see somebody broke down and they're trying to change a tire, don't stop. We can't stop in this culture. Don't do silly stuff. But you have to be willing when people need something to be able to have an open giving heart. But we're so bottled up, and I've told you before how we don't talk to anybody, because back in the day, there's a lot of front porch sitting went on, but nowadays we pull into our garage, we close our garage door, we go into our air-conditioned house, we turn on our TV, and we don't even interact with the neighbor, so sometimes we don't even know the need, right? <clears throat> and lukewarm Christians feel like, they'll, they'll give when they feel like it, they'll give if they want to, uh, they'll give it make, if it makes them look good. You know, if, if, you know, you could get some folks to give a little bit out of the pocket. Uh, if I did a big fundraising drive, who'll give a hundred? Well, if it makes me look good, I'll give, I'll stand up. I'll give a hundred. Everybody can see me give a hundred, right? You ever been to those churches where they're like, I'll give a, you know. So I'll give when it's convenient, but don't push me to do something I don't want to do. Uh, committed Christ, listen to me, guys. Committed Christians believe everything comes from God and everything belongs to God. Lukewarm Christians believe everything is mine. No one likes this kind of preaching because it's my money, it's my business. My time, it's my business. My life is my business. But see, I don't, want to give, I don't want to be a giver just when it's convenient. I want to give cheerfully, and I want to give purposely, and I want to be intentional about it. All right? Talking about characteristics of a lukewarm Christian, and we're at number seven. This is the last one. Last one. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, when it all boils down to it, lukewarm Christians are not much different than the rest of the world. I, I preached to myself a lot when I was making these notes. I looked at myself. Where am I at in all this? Because we get full. You know? But lukewarm Christians, we're not much different than the rest of the world. Why? Well, because we watch the same movies. We, we, we indulge in the same content. We visit the same websites. Listen to the same music. You know, uh, um, probably the greatest... Christian music influence of my life passed away this week. Carmen Lee Cradello, if you all knew who Carmen was, if you ever listened to Christian music in the 80s and 90s, the most influential person, and he was right in my time period. And my Aunt Michelle was on the second row today, <clears throat> and we took a trip to Washington, D.C., New York City, and Niagara Falls, and Philadelphia. Two weeks with my grandparents in the Oldsmobile 98. Those were big cars. Like an 1988 Oldsmobile 98. Silver. Me and Aunt Shelley and my cousin Julie in the back seat, two weeks road tripping. And she had a cassette tape by Carmen. And that tape was called Coming On Strong. And I remember listening back there with headphones. My grandpa didn't like music much. And we'd pass around that cassette. And man, it just got to me. And he released album after album after album. I still have all the CDs. Imagine, I still have CDs. And there was a difference, a notable difference when I was a young person growing up in church between the worldly music. Now, listen, I like some Ice Ice Baby, all right? <laughs> About six months ago or a year ago, <clears throat> gosh, a year, I was before COVID, I was driving on Broadway by the shopping center in Centralia. And when <clears throat> I was a teenager, we would cruise the strip in Centralia. And we'd from the shopping center out to the high school and back, and we were cool, man, we'd cruise them. That's what you do in towns when there's nothing to do. And I, I, I caught myself listening to 90s on 9, driving past Long John Silver's, the shopping center, and Ice Ice Baby was on. I'm like, I'm by myself. And I kind of like, hey, I'm, I might be 45 years old, but I'm cruising the strip in Centralia listening to not, uh, Ice Ice Baby. Like, I felt like I was in high school again, you know. But do I, do I have to even spell out to you the content of the music in today's culture? Straight up perversion? Yes. Ridiculous. Filth? I sound like my grandfather. Oh, God, what are you listening to? Oh. <laughs> Leonard Skinner got nothing on Cardi B, guys. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. We don't want to get caught up listening to that junk. We don't want to get caught up filling our mind with that stuff. I'm just going to preach to you. Like, somebody's got to say it. I got to say it, all right? We, we got to be careful what we ingest or we'll be no different than the world because we download the same content. We have this, we'll, we'll wind up being loose. Oh, we come to church on Sunday. We love God, but we have the same morals as everybody else in the world. We raise our kids the way everybody else raises their kids. We have the same divorce rate in the church as the world has. We have the same, right? Because we have comfortable Christianity. 
And comfortable Christianity is like, I want everything God has for me, but I want to do any of the things God wants me to do. I want enough of Jesus to make it to heaven, but not so much that it makes me one of those people that are just like consumed with all that spiritual stuff. We want the benefits of what Christ did without conforming to who Christ is. Songs always pop in my head when I'm making sermons. And y'all, I'm going to go way back, and some of y'all have no idea what I'm talking about. But there was an 80s Christian group called the Garmo and Key. You got you to be 80s Christians. And there was a song that was sung when I was a young, a young kid. I, 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 was a, I was born in 74. I would, 80s were my wheelhouse, right? And my cousin Randy was our youth leader, and he had a cassette tape of the Garmo and Key. And the song still sticks with me from the 80s. And the song was called Casual Christian. And, and it said, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a casual Christian. I don't want to live, I don't want to live a lukewarm life. Because I want to light up the night with an everlasting light. I don't want to live a casual Christian life. Wanting the benefits of what Christ did without conforming to who Christ is. And the big problem with all the stuff I'm preaching about today, okay, can I preface what I'm about to say by telling you you're never going to be perfect and nobody's asking you to be. So that, I'm not... Nobody's asking you to be perfect. We're all going to be people. We're all going to make mistakes. And things happen to people because we're people. And the grace of Jesus Christ and the blood, the Bible said the blood of Jesus can cover a multitude of sins. Okay. But hear me. The big problem with all seven of these characteristics is that Jesus said, if we're lukewarm, it makes him want to vomit. talking about Christian atheists, guys, someone who believes in God but lives as if he doesn't exist. So I believe in God, but I don't, I don't want to go overboard. You know. And that mindset creates the lifestyle of the lukewarm Christian. Now, I'll be honest with you, it's easy to be lukewarm. Very easy to be lukewarm because we got, we got, we got so much. And it's like Laodicea. Think about that, that old, that ancient city. And think about us today. We got theaters. We got stadiums. We got shopping centers. We got restaurants, right? And, and worse yet, we're, we're worse than them because we have the internet, we have computers, and we have smartphones, and we have social media. And the Lord said, tell the church, you say I am rich. I got everything I want. I don't need a thing. But the Lord was looking spiritually and said, no, nah, you're wretched, miserable, poor, and naked because you're worldly you have worldly wealth, but you are spiritually bankrupt. Kind of like you're just lukewarm and loving it. You're just living. Man, I got, oh, man, that's great. Worldly wealth, but you're spiritually bankrupt. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. You're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. But he finished his letter to that church by saying, look, this is what's up. This is what I see. I don't like it. it. Kind of makes me sick. But I'm standing at the door and knocking. All right? Imagine that just. We got the worldly volume so high that we don't even hear it. It's only every once in a while when you dial it down, it gets louder. You get by yourself, you get out by the lake, you put your phone in the car, you turn off the radio, you get alone on a trail, go up on the chipmunk trail, nobody's out there, somewhere, you get out there, and it's, it hits harder and harder. What is this? What is that? What's going on? It's the Lord in your life, because He is not willing that anybody would be lost, but that everybody would come to repentance. And He's knocking at the door, and the Bible said, I'm standing here, and I'm knocking, I'm knocking. If you hear my voice... If you open the door, he's not going to beat it down, guys. He's just going to knock. <laughs> if you hear me, if you open, he said, if anybody who hears me, anybody who opens the door, I'll come in. Amen. I'll come in. Amen. And I love this part. We'll share a meal together as friends. 
Not just, hey, how you doing? I'm going to stay a while. We're talking about, I believe in God, but I don't know him. I don't fear him. I don't go overboard. But you know, when you know him, you will crave acceptance from him and him only. You'll share his gospel whenever it's possible. You will long to be with him in heaven. This world will not be your home. You will give radically and you will give generously and you will be a fanatic about giving. You will seek God and you'll faithfully look for him every single day. You will grieve over your sin. You'll be different. You'll be set apart. You will not be like the world. You'll be different. Anybody, what's up with that? That person now they're a Jesus freak. Hey, that's cool. You can call me whatever. I, I, I love Jesus. He has changed my life. And so my question today, we close this service up today. <clears throat> my question is, do you know him? And are you on the fence? And I want to encourage you. He's knocking. Well, Pastor said I was lukewarm. I'm not coming back next Sunday. I'll come back. We all get lukewarm from time to time. And a message like this comes into your life and you just, just remind you to listen to that knock. I remind you, listen to that knock because he's there and he's ready and he's waiting. I'm going to ask Amy to sing a little bit here in a second. And I want to invite anyone who wants to make a decision today. This is a series for altar calls. We don't do this all the time, but right now I believe it and feel it. I want to ask you to stand with me all across the place. Just a few more minutes, guys. Just stand with you. With me. And I want to just invite an attitude of prayer. As Amy sings, just, just open your heart and, and let worship come in out of you. And if you feel motivated and you want prayer, you want to just take another step. I want to step down here. And I want to invite you to come forward for prayer. And that when you coming forward is a declaration. I don't want to be a casual Christian. Whoa, he's talking to me. Somebody's like, well, if I go down there, everybody's going to know. Who cares? I'm just offering an opportunity to pray. Just take one step saying, you know what? I, I don't want that. I, I want to dedicate myself to God this day, today, right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes right now begin to pray. Amy, begin to sing. This altar is open to anyone who wants to pray right now. So feel free to just kind of push in, guys. Just push in a little bit if you would. Come on up front. Let people give us, let's get some room. I'm not here for
just for about another 30 seconds. Would you reach out to God? Open your heart. Open your heart to him right now and just ask him to come into your life, whatever you're doing. Would you invite him into your heart right now? Say, I want you, Jesus, send me. He's knocking on your door. Somebody open it up. Yes, come in. Oh, by all means, come in. Anybody here just weary? You got a little weary of the world. It's beat you up. It's chewed you up and it's spit you out. It's hard on you. It's been a tough year. Last 12 months been tough, guys. And he's just knocking. I got something the world can't give you and the world can't take it away. I pray that you'd receive it right now. And I pray on everybody in this place, everybody who's still watching online, there's a handful of you still watching. I pray that God would invade your living room right now invade your car right now wherever you are invade this space right now and that he would move in your life and I pray that you would open the door to the possibility of a walk with God like you have never had before in your life that he's going to lead you and guide you not just wandering around aimlessly but led and guided by the Holy Spirit yeah yeah So if you're here right now or you're watching online, I want to invite you to pray with me, okay? I don't want anybody to pray by yourself. Would you open up right now and pray this prayer? Somebody repeat after me. Somebody say, Heavenly Father, I surrender. Take my life. Make me new. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Would you say, God, forgive me? Lord, fill me. <laughs> Say it like this. Say, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for new life. And I, wanna, I want you to say this real quick. I want you to say this. Say, God, I open the door. Come in. Make me new. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody clap your hands. Let's give God praise right now. Guys, I want to encourage you to spend time with the Lord. I say that every Sunday, the, the best way to respond to this message is by spending time with God every day. You don't want to be a lukewarm Christian, be casual about it. Get your Bible out. Dust that thing off, man. Get an app on your phone. I would, I would suggest getting the, uh, I can't think of it. What, what's the Bible app? Version Bible app. Just type in Bible in your app store. It's there. Version Bible app. And if nothing else, get a scripture a day. But then get a hold of a reading plan. I'm going to take a little time before you leave. Get a hold of a reading plan and dig into the Word of God. You'd be surprised what can happen. Okay, somebody here today is like, I don't know what to read. And you open up the book of Leviticus. Don't do that. You'll quit in a five, it'll be over with. But get a, get a, you all got smartphones and some of you got dumb phones. But if you have smartphones. Get that YouVersion Bible app and, and click on a reading plan, and it will guide you through. And there's probably a reading plan to fit the question you are asking right now. There's probably a reading plan that will hit you where you are right now. Do that plan every day and have some time of devotion. You want to make a difference? You want to let God open? You want to open up and let God in? That's the way to do it. Pray and ask Him to come into your heart. Spend time with God. Because I don't want to be a casual Christian. And, I, and can I say this? I, 
I'm not, I'm not talking, when I say what I'm about to say, I'm not talking politics and I'm not talking uh, that world. I'm talking there's an undertone, there's something going on spiritually that has zero to do with who the president is. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. There's an undertone spiritually that pastors everywhere feel. It began to move in me early this year that God is about to break open something that we have never seen before. Okay? And I'm not going to be the one over here, oh, God, bless what I'm doing. I'm going to pray, God, let me be a part of what you are blessing. And let this church be right in line for where you're leading. Right? And that's where we want to be. And that's what this message series is about, preparing our hearts and our minds and our souls for what God can do. We're not going to miss it. We're going to be involved in it. And this place is going to be filled. We're going to have to add another service back. Why? Because people are hungry and no virus can keep them away and no fear can keep them away. They need God. And that's what we're getting back to. That's what we're getting back to. All right, guys, that's today's service. I hope you're challenged. I hope you're challenged and inspired today. I'll remind you there are giving boxes on both sides of the door. You can give online at lifechurchcarlisle.com. Your generosity is much appreciated. Thank you for being so good during this time. Love you for that. Next week, we're going to dedicate some babies. Don't sit out because of that, because there's going to be a good charge comes. Well, he's not going to preach next week. Oh, yeah, I am. And we're going to dedicate babies and talk about how important this is, raising our kids. Now, next week's message is going to be about raising our kids in the way they should go so that when they're old, they will not depart from it. And the week after that, I'm going to finish this series up, all right? And we're going to get to know God a little bit more. I pray this blessing on your life today. If you're watching online, if you're in this place, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his name, Jesus. I love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.